My name is Trish Boland. I'm a member of the Title I Association. Um, I am the state Title I director from Colorado, so it was an easy flight for me. It's a pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today. Katie Garner is an author, speaker, consultant, and educator with nearly 20 years of classroom experience. Ms. Garner will reveal new ways to approach the teaching of reading and writing by using the latest neuroplasticity research. Say it with me, neuroplasticity, yes. It is a way to sneak through the brain's back door for easier access to critical literacy skills. Please welcome Katie Garner. Thank you. I didn't realize you were from Colorado, that's because that's actually where I'm going, so <laughs> I'll be going to their conference next, that's right. So hopefully the weather is as nice as it is here. Um, thank you. If you are just coming in, I just want to say a couple of really quick things before we get started. One is, uh, please make sure that you have a red handout. I'm talking into this mic like it's actually there. I'm lavaliered. Um, <laughs> please make sure that you have a red handout because you will need that to access um, another set of handouts beyond those that are uploaded to the Title I site. So you can download the ones on the Title I site and then you can also access through the red handout that you have, and there's some extra ones up here, and then they're at the back tables. You can download both the PowerPoint as well as um, a, a, a slightly extended handout packet um, at this website at the very bottom. I'm gonna show you a couple of other things that you're gonna be able to download once we all get um, in and seated, and it probably is gonna be a full or fairly full session, so if you have seats in the center, I will tell everybody coming in, there is writing strewn about. It's not um, for saving seats, so feel free. If you see seats that are open in the center, they're probably open. They just don't look like they are. And then, of course, there's seats up here at the front as well. Okay, and, and again, if any time uh, you realize you don't have a handout and you need to get one, you're welcome to come up to the front or either of the back tables as well. Um, I want to welcome you. We are going to be focusing on how to sneak learners through the brain's back door so that we don't have to keep skirting around the giant elephant in the room that is constantly an obstacle when we are looking at how we teach reading, writing, and spelling using the code. Now, before we get started on that track, I wanna make sure that you have everything that you need to extend and flesh out what I am literally going to breeze through in the next hour, because my plan is to talk twice as fast as I normally would to get through two hours worth of material in one hour, but to do it very clearly so that everybody can follow me as we move and that you have um, a resource to go to once session's over to flesh out or dig for deeper details um, on some of the things that we talk through. So that is where this website comes in. And just to show you a couple of things that you're gonna find, and I think there, okay good, I thought I just turned it off. Your session packet's here. I'm gonna show you where your handout and the PowerPoint is first. If you look at this uh, little line of windows here, there's a window that says conference in service. Just simply go to that. Since we're at a conference, it's easy to remember. When you go to that, you'll see a list of dates for where I'll be working with different districts and different states or speaking at conferences. But what you want to focus on is a little picture at the top that looks like a little mini handout. And if you click on that, it will download a slightly larger handout than the one that's um, been uploaded to the website through Title I. Um, and that's just because it was tougher to get it to upload with all the graphics. It's a very large file. It actually takes about a minute and a half to download, and um, your computer will seem like it's delayed, but it's just that big of a, of a file. It's a very graphic-laden file. The other piece that you might want to look for is a PowerPoint, because if you are taking back and sharing information with staff, you're not going to want to make a 40-page handout for every single staff member. So it's much easier, I think, to just pull from the PowerPoint it's in a PowerPoint format, actually, so you don't even have to use the full PowerPoint. You can just pull pieces that you found were interesting or useful for your situation. And that is found on the window that is, oops, that is here, the video PowerPoint. There are some video clips that are for a specific purpose, which I'll talk about as well, because that's where you can see firsthand with real kids the strategies that I'm going to be talking about, but actually in in, um, in real life, in a classroom format, happening in real time, and with a variety of different learners. So there's a lot to be found on the site beyond just the few things that I'm telling you to look for, uh, but that is where the PowerPoint can be found. And I know we still have people coming in, so this is the equivalent of me just doing a little tap dance before we 
officially start, so just please bear with me. I'm going to go ahead and fast forward through one more thing. This is a very unintuitive remote because when I press the right hand side on the opposite side of the left, it looks like it should go forward, but instead it just turns it off. So let me go back again. Forward, okay. I see the big button is forward. I have uploaded, uh, and this is something that may or may not be of use to you if you're in a state that does or does not um, adhere to the Common Core, most of us do. Um, I have uploaded, and you can download them free, um, some Common Core posters for pre-K, K, first, second, and third. I apologize if you're above third, but my knowledge base only went so far when it came to, you know, math and science and social studies with regard to some, um, that's sad to say, but there were some pretty heavy duty things once you get to those middle school common core standards in terms of specificity at each grade level. My goal was to try to look at things from a backward direction and give a depiction of what the objective or the intent of the, uh, the skill base is. So what that means is through some sort of picture format, put it into place so that learners can see what the goal of the game is regarding that skill. And I'm just telling you this off the cuff because if you'd like to download them, you're welcome to do that. They're on the site as well. This is just a little snapshot to, to see. It's kind of like a little, bra a, a little brain based approach to what we have to often put up in our classrooms. And instead of having them up just for accountability sake, it's nice to have them be um, useful anchors for not just us, but for the kids and for volunteers that need to know immediately what the intention of the objective is and then jump right into it with kids. If we have to spend more time teaching our volunteers so that they can teach our kids, it's almost you know, a worthless effort. So it's nice to have anchors that are self explanatory. And I think with Common Core, since it's a base of so much of what we're doing, that was a good place to put that time into uh, creating these. So I wanted to just let you know those are there for you as well. And last thing, this is the place that I was talking about where you're going to be able to pull down and flesh out what we're going to be running through and starting to do in about two minutes. This is, uh, I have a vlog and a blog. The vlog are videos of basically what I try to work and talk about on the blog. The blog, I've actually been incorporating teachers from other states to come in and, and show how they're using the strategies that we're going to talk about with their different grade levels, with different exceptionalities, um, different types of populations of students, language learning. Um, it's a great way to see strategies in action. So the blog has links to the video clips, but it's also a lot of sharing from other teachers and administrators. Uh, a really adorable one that was just called, uh, an administrator actually was involved with doing it, and it was um, focusing around a, uh, a, um, a referral that he had to write uh, that said, we don't eat our friends. And it was because of an issue that had happened with Sparkle the Elf and how the gingerbread men actually had been bullying him so much after hours that he finally had had enough. And one night during the holidays, he ate the gingerbread men in the classroom. So the principal came across a site with a bunch of crumbs and Sparkle, the, because they had actually, there were other issues where Sparkle had been tied up by the gingerbread men, so the class would come in and see him all tied up with licorice on the chair. So there were ongoing bullying incidents that occurred. But all of this to say that it culminated in a persuasive writing activity, which for the purpose of what we're going to be talking about is just a, a useful um, direction to put these skills to work with. Kids were adamant about not having um, Sparkle serve his time in the office, which is the holiday time. It was his only time to be free. So they wanted him back in their classroom, but he had an in-school suspension. And Sparkle the Elf is, basically looks like the shelf on the elf, or the elf on the shelf. So um, it was a great opportunity to really pull out the skills that we're going to be talking about and give kids a focus or a direction um, with having to write to the principal and explain the bullying situation that he was unaware of that caused this to occur. So very unusual situations like that are written about and posted with videos that give um, a good insight, not just for teachers, but for administrators. And also kids love to see these, but it's all about how to put into place or into action what we're going to be talking about here from a strategy end. So I love the blog. It's been a wonderful collaborative effort. But the vlog, which is the video version of it, is going to be more useful for you as a base of follow-up for this. And the blog is a YouTube channel, Ugh, and I just did the same thing. Um, you will be able to see little clips that will focus on topics that I might toss out and mention, but don't go into detail on. If I were doing a, a workshop at a school district, this would be a six hour workshop. So there are a lot of things that are just amazing when we look at what the research allows us to do and how we can attack certain issues that we all innately have in the classroom when we're working with reading, writing, and spelling, especially the code. Um, a lot of those pieces we're going to touch on, but I won't be able to demonstrate or um, give you little tricks to use them. Uh, 
but on the vlog, you'll be able to actually pull what you'd like to see more of. So that's a great place to go to after we're finished. And all of this is found um, on this website. So I would encourage you to hold on to this red sheet, put it with your handout packet, staple it to it. This is not something included in the handout packet. It's also going to be a, a nice little cheat sheet or cliff notes for th some of the things we're going to talk about graphically. And I think I'm ready to start. It looks like our uh, entrance is slowed down a little bit, so that's good. Anybody that does not have a seat, please feel free to just come up to the front. There's a lot of seats up here. I see people standing on the back or sitting on the floor. You're welcome to come up. You won't disrupt anything. And please also make sure that you do have a red handout. And if someone in the back would let people know as they come in that they are welcome to sit in the seats that have writing on them. They're not saved so that nobody has to stand unnecessarily. Okay, and we're ready to go ahead and get started officially now. So, I am Katie, and I am so thrilled to be here. Literally, I'm just as excited as I can be. Um, I am going to talk to you about something that many of you may already recognize exists, but a lot of us have become so accustomed to, we don't even see it anymore. And it is the giant elephant in the room that we all skirt around to make sense of what has no logic attached to it, which is the alphabet, the letters, the sounds, phonics patterns. Depending on whether you're actually with a class in your own room, or if you are a support staff person, a reading coach, a literacy specialist, or administrator, you may or may not be as familiar with the elephant that stands in our way as, as those around you. But just to give you a general idea, of what this elephant looks like and the havoc that it causes. Imagine telling your class, as many of you sitting here probably do, that Y says, yeah. And you sing your little alphabet song and you say, Y says, yo, yo, yeah, yeah, yeah. You walk away happy. But then you walk to your calendar, which is your next course of action if you're in a primary grade classroom because you do it every day. And you proceed to blow to heck everything you just said about the letter Y because they see that Y all over that calendar but it's not making the one sound that you told them to attack it with. You only gave them one tool when it came to that Y. You said, Y says yo, yo, y, y, y. That's the equivalent of saying, here's a symbol. When you see this symbol, here's what you're gonna hit it with. This is the sound it's gonna make. So when you see this symbol, you make this sound. But then when you went to the calendar, we saw words like Monday, Tuesday, January, July, May, Wednesday. Uh, let's see, it could say E, oh, February. It could say E, it said I. It said A. Now, it didn't say Y yeah at all, so at least there's one pattern that the brain can attach itself to, which is when I see this letter, the one thing I can be sure about, because I have no clue what it will actually say, but the one thing I know for sure is it's not going to say Y. Yeah. Because unless the word is yellow, yes, you or yak, you'd be hard pressed to find the Y actually making the Y yeah sound in a K2 classroom. You really would. It would be very difficult for you to find it, especially when you compare it to the frequency with which that letter is found saying everything else under the sun. And I haven't even talked about the boys bathroom. <laughs> I mean, they see that letter everywhere. Basically, if it can say E and it can say I and it can say A and it can say OI, it's doing about everything it can in terms of the vowels except for the U sound. Except it is the first letter in the word U. So it's gotta be incredibly frustrating for a logical thinker. And a lot of times this is why our boys will lag behind Girls don't like things that don't make sense either, but we're, we can deal with them. I mean, in other words, they don't drive us crazy. If it doesn't make sense, we're just like, wow, that's kind of weird. But anyway, <laughs> with the boys, they literally are looking at it like a puzzle. Like, I should be able to put it together and take it apart, which means then I should be able to put it together again. If it's a code, it should look the same way, no matter how you twist it, turn it, flip it, or flop it. And it's very frustrating to always be met with basically the scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz that does this. Because that's how you have to feel if you're aware of what you're actually saying to kids in the first hour of any primary grade classroom. Because all you do, typically, in the first hour of a primary grade classroom is run through the consistent patterns of the day, whether that's the calendar, whether that's your attendance activity where the learners get to identify their name or the spellings, whether it's you know, going over um, uh, math counts, again, with your calendar, whatever little activities you have that are part of your housekeeping in a group setting, those are something that the kids adhere to daily, and they do it like a mantra. So within just that little tiny piece of the day, they're being met with every 
contradiction possible when it comes to these letters and sounds. And the lower the grade level, the worse it is. Because we can't use phonics to account for even half of the things the letters do. See, even if you're in second or third and you have access to phonics, because typically, you know, we teach reading, they learn to read in K-1-2 so that they can read to learn in 3-4-5. That's the, the ideal hump of instruction. We learn to read in K-1-2 so that we can read to learn in 3-4-5. Because nothing after second grade is involving in curriculum learning how to read. Once kids are in third grade, it's all about reading for a purpose, drawing in an inference, making a prediction, pulling information from text. The test is not about learning how to read. The test that learners take is all about what can you do with your reading capability. With the reading ability that you have, what can you do with it? And how much processing power is it taking up for you to be able to make your way through that text? And what's left over for you to actually draw an inference, see the irony, laugh at the joke, notice the, the, um, the motivation that's maybe not written in, in spoken word, but that you can understand or relate to as a reader of why the character did what she did. Those things require some, some thinking power. They require some attention. And if your attention is completely focused on what letter is that, what pattern is it, what sound does it make, that didn't work, what else can I try, what else could it be? You don't have what you need for that, that depth of complexity when it comes to testing and what, you're, what learners are required to do at a very early age. Now, we'll often mistake that for comprehension issues. But if a learner laughs at the joke when you read it, interrupts you while you're reading the story to tell you how they went to the same place last summer when they went on vacation with their family, their problem's not comprehension. Their problem's comprehension when they also have to do the reading which means their real problem is automaticity of skills, automaticity with the code. Having it so deep in the gut that it's not even on the radar, they're like we are. They are just so automatic, they're not even thinking about letters and sounds. They're pulled into the reading or they're expressing themselves in their writing and their focus is everywhere else except what does Y say? <laughs> because that can't be anywhere near the forefront of thought. Now, when we talk about automaticity with skills, we're talking about the code. And I gave you a little glimpse of what that little elephant can look like when it's in the room, because the why is just one little piece. Imagine, for example, that you went to um, Las Vegas, and you had $100, and you had to put your money on whether or not you would see a letter that looks like this, say, tss, or tss, most of the time, in any book you pick up in the hotel or in the city. Any book you pick up, are you going to see the letter that looks like this, say tss or tss the most. Raise your hand if you think you'll see it saying tss the most. Okay, what about Now, for those of you that are sticklers, you might say, well, but you said T, you didn't say TH. T doesn't say TH says you said what sound will this letter make? If you look at it from the bottom up, which learners are always looking at things from the bottom up, they just know there's a letter that looks like this. She says, you see a letter that looks like this. It's called T. It goes T. So I see this letter everywhere. It's in every book I have. And every time I see this letter, I go T. And I'm always wrong. And I don't even know why she says to go T because she doesn't do that. She sees a letter that looks like this in all our big books. And she doesn't go T. She sticks her tongue out and does something else. And I don't know what it is. But whatever it is, she, could get, she gets the word. She has no problem reading the word. I can't read it at all. I wish she'd tell me the tongue trick she uses to read the word. Now, the TH is not formally appearing on the scope and sequence of instruction, curriculum-wise, until first grade, somewhere around fall. You couldn't get through the first hour of pre-K without having that pattern hit you in every book you pick up to read or anything you would even think about trying to write. So it's harder in the earlier grade levels because the access is solely on individual letters and sounds. That is what their tool base consists of in kindergarten. And the individual letters and sounds behave beautifully when they're on the wall on an alphabet train. But when they jump off of that train and get into words where they're butted up against other letters like themselves, it's almost as if little electrical currents go off and a whole other sound can emerge. And we as teachers who in, in just, um, what would I call it? We, we literally just try to uh, bombard learner, not bombard because that sounds negative, um, and there's a word I'm looking for that I can't think of right now, but we just engage them with text on a constant basis. So they're getting far more reinforcement of the inconsistencies than they are on the consistencies. And if truth be told, if you were a betting person, the likelihood that the letters are actually going to make the sounds they do in the alphabet are about 10 to 1 across the board because almost all of them have other sounds that they much more enjoy making when they're in actual words. So any kind of reinforcement with text 
will negate the efforts that we put into learning the individual letters and sounds, which is the base of our instruction at the earliest grade levels. And I'm still talking to this microphone that is not even on, so I'm going to just move over here. I didn't realize I'd be so good at that or I wouldn't have asked him to lavalier me. I told him there's no way I'm going to be able to remember to stay in front of that microphone, and now that's all I'm doing. Okay, now we're going to move forward with this because this is really the core of the problem. When things don't make sense, the brain has no option in terms of capturing the information, like the code, other than repetitive use and practice. So if we all agree that letters and sounds and patterns, which we also call phonics, is not logical, then we are, and even if you think, by the way, that phonics makes it all better, even phonics is about a six times out of 10 in terms of, and I'm not criticizing it, that's what we've got to work with, and there's actually a way when we go through the back door that we can up that number to about nine times out of 10. And then the last little bit's actually the fun part, because that's where we get to play with what's outside of the box. But for now, when we look at traditional phonics skills, when there's no logical explanation for why a letter does this except when it doesn't because sometimes it won't and it might do that, it's, it just is, it just does. You just have to remember, that's the mantra that we stick with and when we have to say that, we're putting learners in a position where they have to repetitively use the skills in order to not lose them. And we know which, which learners are not gonna get the use time to own those skills. We can pick that out in the first hour of kindergarten because they're the one, well, not the first hour, the first day, actually the second day, because the morning they come in with their backpacks, we unzip them, we can tell who looked in those backpacks and who didn't. We know which backpacks we've zipped up that have not seen the light of day since they were in our classroom at three o'clock the day before, because we're looking in and all those really important notes that we needed to get information back on, they're sitting exactly as we left them when we packed it up at three. So those are the learners that won't get the use it time they need for these skills to solidify. And those are the learners that in fourth, fifth, sixth grade have these gaping holes in skillability. And that's why going through the back door and using brain plasticity um, research to do it is the key. Because when we can take things through a different um, doorway, we aren't subject to what has to be in place first in order for those skills to make it through. In other words, typically you have a hierarchy of skill building. You have to have, for instance, a ground in place to build a house. You know, it is very difficult for fourth grade teachers to teach a particular skill that requires other skills be in place first. If those other skills aren't in place, if that fourth grade learner is reading at a first grade level, it's very frustrating as that fourth or fifth grade teacher because you can't plant something without any dirt. When you go through the back door, you have a whole different set of circumstances that you're working with, and it gives you a completely different perspective. So that's where we're gonna head with this. I'm gonna press that button every time. When we teach the way the brain learns, it is equivalent to swimming in a pool where the current is pushing behind the learners, which means that the strong swimmers can pick, take two strokes and they're across the pool in a heartbeat. The weak swimmers, who barely even know a stroke, can just kinda hang out and do the dead man's float and they'll be propelled across the pool by default because you can't help but learn when information is put out in a way that aligns with exactly how the brain picks it up. You, you don't even have to apply any purposeful effort, it just occurs. There's a miracle with brain-based teaching that, uh, there's a miracle, there's a, a, a quote that states that um, miracles become common and consistent when you teach with the brain in mind. And that is so completely correct, because what looks like a miracle is actually commonplace. It's to be expected. It's like saying to the kids, who wants a cookie? What do you think is gonna happen? I do, I do, I do! It's, it's not a miracle that you could have a, 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 a great premonition of what the class would say if you offer a cookie out loud. It's easy to expect common expectations of what learners will be able to do that might appear to be almost like a miracle with regard to how they were capable of doing it, but yet it's commonplace when you go with the current of the brain. Now, on the opposite end, when you teach in opposition to the way the brain learns, it is like swimming uphill. Well, it's like swimming against the current or fighting an uphill battle, so you can't swim uphill. But if you could swim uphill, that's exactly what it would be like <laughs> for going against the brain. It's like having learners in a pool where the current is going against them. And now what happens to your strong swimmers? They might get across, but it is hard. They have to put forth every bit of effort and skill that they have. All the practice is really coming into place. Their endurance is really being tested. And maybe if they can keep it up and not lose interest, they will make it to the other end of the pool. But they're gonna work hard and it's gonna take them longer. Your weaker swimmers are gonna drown before they let go of the wall. 
because as soon as that current starts to fight against them with the limited skillability that they have and the lack of endurance that they've got, they're gonna be immediately overcome by that current. So on the best of days, this is what it's like teaching the code. When you're trying to give the brain something that has no predictable patterns, quote, logic inherent in it, you are forcing the brain to go against its learning style. The learning style of the brain is to identify patterns and then attempt to connect the patterns it identifies with those that it already has, so as to create new ones. And when that connection occurs, you hear from learners, oh, I get it. What that means is whatever they already knew to be true fits perfectly with whatever it is that's brand new that you just tossed out. They get to own it by default. It's almost like cheating, because you just glued something that was brand new content that they had no way of knowing automatically, but it fit perfectly together with something they already did know automatically and had traveled or accessed to that information many times because they've used it many times. Now that new content gets to just go straight through that buffer that typically requires use it or lose it in order to be captured and owned. That new information gets to cheat. It gets to be glued up against old information, which means now I get to own both by default. If you tell me where a new restaurant is that I've never been to, I have no idea how to get there and I have no sense of direction whatsoever. But it just so happens that it's right behind the house of my best friend who moved away last year, but I've been to her house a thousand times. Now, poof, I know how to get to the restaurant. Not because I've ever been there or even paid attention to the directions you tried to give me, because actually when you gave me the directions, I didn't even realize that that was my best friend's house. It's just that when I realized that happened to be right behind Shelly's house, I now own, like the back of my hand, the directions to that restaurant. That's the way the brain likes to learn. The whole use it or lose it is the alternative to that. That's the information we got in a college class that we didn't like, but we had to take it and we learned it and we did well on the test and then we promptly forgot all of it because we had no personal need or use for it at all. That is the information that we learned through use it or lose it. And I use the word learn uh, loosely because we didn't really learn it, we rented it for a while. We used it frequently enough so that we could regurgitate it onto the test and our, by the way, our level of use is different for everyone. Some of the use it or lose it threshold, and we're gonna talk about that in a few minutes, but use it or lose it, that threshold for how many times a learner has to use it and in what way, varies from learner to learner. Some learners can use something or in meaning do something or hear something once, twice, they got it. Those were your friends who went to every party over the weekend and still got an A on their test. Then there were those of us who had to lock ourselves in our dorm room, pretend we didn't even know there were any parties, and literally write it over and over, recite it out loud, pretend we were teaching it. Just every possible way we could think of to use, practice, or regurgitate that information either aloud in writing or just even thinking about it before you go to sleep so that we would have it cold by Monday. But by Thursday of that week, it was gone because we didn't use it again as soon as we finished that test. So that is not the brain's preferred method and it's certainly for educators not our preferred method because for learners who only get the use it time with us when they're in school, we know that those skills will disappear over the summer and while they're at home. And then that's how we get those big holes in their skillability and we get what is a very unlevel playing field when it comes to being able to use these skills for what they're taught for, which is to learn, to pull information and then to communicate with writing. Now, one more thing I wanna say about this code before I go any farther with this, and that is that if you think of reading, writing, and spelling and all the things that go into those symbols and sounds, like Morse code, it gives you a better perspective of how the brain processes them. If you were to teach at the Naval Academy and you were teaching Morse code, you would not have your Morse code sending class in the morning and your Morse code receiving class in the afternoon because it's one and the same. If they're practicing sending, they're getting equally um, competent with receiving because as they're sending, the ability to receive is strengthened. And as they practice receiving, the ability to send is strengthened. They are self-reinforcing. Reading and writing are identical processes in the brain up to the point of automaticity, which means reading makes a better writer and writing makes for a better reader. You're just, it's like putting a house together with blocks and then taking it apart and building a hotel with those blocks and then taking that apart and building a bridge that has a little hotel and a little house. And it's, if you have command of those blocks and what you can do with them, then whether you're taking apart or putting together, your ownership of knowledge and skill and, and, and um, automaticity with those tools is the same. So, 
for us to divide reading and writing. Now, I'm not talking about in the upper grades, and by upper I even mean from third on. When you're looking at writing for a different purpose, when you're writing for, you know, um, looking at organizing and structure and, um, you know, introducing new vocabulary, that's a different purpose. That's writing for a different means. I'm talking about at the early grade levels where writing, where the biggest challenge is, how do I spell it? You know, what, I'm just going to say it's big, it's fun, I like it, it's fun, it's really, really fun. Why am I saying that my favorite animal in the whole world, who I could talk about for three hours, is just fun? Because that's what I can spell. I wanted to tell you that he camouflages himself and that he lives in the tropical rainforest of Uganda and, and blah, blah, blah. And I don't know if there is a tropical rainforest in Uganda. So if you teach social studies and you're thinking, okay, so she doesn't know anything about social studies. <laughs> but in any event, learners want to write like they talk. And then, and then, and then, and then, and then, because they always know something about something that they love to share and tell, even if they have to segue themselves to Christmas, you know, because they might start out writing about the topic, but then end up writing, by, especially if you're at an early grade level. You have no idea where they'll end up. They love, and I'm really talking more about talking. They don't apply this to their writing until the skills just kind of ooze right out and are easy, easily accessed and put down. That's actually the reason I dragged this around with me is because it shows, and all of the writing is in one sitting, by the way. We're only using writing as a window into the mind of a reader. And as we start and we look at the fact that they're both one and the same, that concept will make more sense. But I drag this around just to show, not the writing, but the automaticity. Writing is in one sitting, and when they're done, they go. Whether they go to centers, uh, you know, or whether we go to lunch, and then they come back, and they can sometimes take things out to recess if they wanted, um, which most of the time they wouldn't unless it were about a topic that they were really interested in, and then you might have them wanting to take it out to recess. But the writing has to be, you couldn't, you couldn't chain a five- or a six-year-old to a chair and make them do this. I mean, if it's not easy, they're not going to do this in one sitting because it would be just sheer and utter torture, and that's if they could even finish the job, which they couldn't. That's the level of automaticity that we want these skills to, to have intact. And not just with first graders, we want this across the board, but if we can do this with these early low-level learners, then it's so much easier actually to do this with the upper grade learners, who really have a tremendously valuable base of experience, but it's so disorganized that it's of no use to them at all in school until they get the file folders in place and can start to pull it into pattern pieces that they can then apply and use for a purpose in reading and writing. And we'll talk about that, but it's interesting to see impact at the earliest level and then apply that to what Michael could do at, you know, in sixth grade. Or your ESL learner who just came to the country and he's in your fifth grade class, but he doesn't know his letters or his sounds. You know, we've got a lot of situations where if I use the word kindergarten, I'm not necessarily talking about a five-year-old. We're really talking about what you would expect one to know at certain grade levels, fourth grade, fifth grade, even at you know, six to 60. And that's another big pet peeve I have um, when I talk to administrators sometimes is they'll, you know, they'll have um, a preconceived notion of, um, well, do you have the skills for, you know, I need the fifth grade version or the third grade version of these skills. There's no version, you know, the code, Morse code is Morse code. You need the code in order to crack the text. The version or the level comes at the text form. What you apply it to is where we level it. What you apply the code to for a fifth grader, that's going to be much higher level text, much more involved vocabulary than what a first grader would. But the code doesn't change. There is no first grade level of the code. Unless you adhere to the theory that breaking it apart into three pieces is helpful, which I completely do not, and that is what I'm going to rail against as we look at what we can do. You can't do diddly squat with a third of the code. If you're a captain on a naval ship and you have a Morse code operator and he's in his first year of the naval school program, but unfortunately he's already been assigned to your ship because he's got to start cracking the code right away, which is, by the way, what we do in kindergarten. They have to start reading and writing on the very first day of school. Unfortunately, they only know, let's say, a third of the code. So let's say they know A through G. Well, as a captain who has to have messages sent out successfully and retrieved, you might be in trouble if his message that he has to relay to the captain, which is you, is a, sub a submarine is coming and it's got a bomb. He doesn't have an S. He doesn't have a U. He's got a B. <laughs> so he's going to get the word bomb. Well, not bomb. He's going to get the word B and no M. He'll have another B at the end, so it'll say BB is coming, or at least he'll have the C that he needs for the word coming. He won't get sub. I mean, the captain's going to have to do a lot of fill in the blanks and try to figure out what he meant when the guy from the Morse code room comes up and says, here's what I wrote. <laughs> Now, sending it's going to be just as difficult if you only have a third of the code. And that is what we do. We break the code up. First grade gets to teach certain things. Kindergarten gets to teach sec certain things. Second grade gets to teach certain things. But only by third grade do they actually have all of it. And you can't read and write with any kind of real interest if you don't own everything. 
Now, how do we get there when it takes everything we've got just to give them a third each year? That's where we go through the back door. And that's where it's fascinating to look at what the little guys can do, especially when you see where they come from with those pre-writing samples, which if you weren't here when I said it earlier, are these. So it's, it's just amazing to watch impact at that level and then apply it to what you're looking at in your, own, in your own school district. Now we're gonna do this very quickly because this is the last thing I wanna do to just re-emphasize the elephant in going against the brain and then I'm gonna scoot through things very quick. So all I wanna do is show you, this is called a Stroop test, but we're not doing it for the purpose of the Stroop test. We're just doing this to show you how it feels to go with the brain versus to work against it. I want you to just say the words, read the text, pay no attention at all to the colors. We're gonna have a good fluency rate, which means I'm gonna keep a little bit of a beat and you're gonna have to keep up with the pace so that nobody is just straggling behind. So actually, I don't know if you can hear that as well. And that's not on, of course, even though I keep talking to it. <sighs> okay, so I'll do this and I'll do it with you for a bit and I'll use my little laser. We're gonna pay no attention to the color. We're just gonna read the words and if you're sitting on that side, hopefully you can see well enough. Ready, set, here we go, red. Blue, orange, purple. Orange, blue, green, red. Blue, purple, green, red. Orange, blue, red. You guys have very good rhythm. Because I didn't even do this loudly and you were just right there. Okay, let's see if you can keep that rhythm and we're gonna do something easier than reading. We're gonna do a pre-K skill, which is color recognition. No reading. As a matter of fact, pretend there aren't even any letters up there. If you see a red word, just say red. If you see a green word, just say green. If you see a purple word, just say purple. Pay absolutely no attention to the text at all, which means if this were a room of four-year-olds, they would be able to do this easily. So you should have no, we should be able to double our fluency rate. We won't, but we should be able to because we're not four. So if the four-year-olds can do it like this, we should be able to do it twice as fast, but we won't because it's early, so we'll just keep a nice, even beat again. We're gonna say red, and luckily for us, the first word is actually red too, but it wouldn't matter anyway because we're only gonna say the colors. So, here we go, I'll keep the beat. Ready, set, here we go. I take back what I said about your rhythm. <sighs> now actually though, that's an interesting thing. It, you actually still have good rhythm, although one would never know from what you just did, because your brain was having to do what I talked about happening with comprehension versus automaticity with skills. When you're so focused on one thing, you don't have anything left over to apply to the other. So the wonderful rhythm that you showed with that first time that we did it went totally to nothing when your brain was completely overwhelmed with trying to process and ignore the text while processing the color and having your mouth be able to say one thing even though the other one was dying to come out. <laughs> and that's interesting just on its own because what that means is something you were perfectly capable of doing, you failed at, not because you couldn't do it, not because you need extra help with it, not because you need modifications made for your rhythm, not because we need to hire a music teacher to work with us on rhythm so we're prepared for the assessment when we have to do this with a rhythmic bass. None of that would be necessary, that would be a waste. The real problem was building automaticity with color recognition when it was in a text form and it was inconsistent. But it's an interesting thing when we look at the funding and the time we spend on working with comprehension modifications, when a learner in fourth or fifth grade might not have the issue with comprehension problems, it's just that's what rears its ugly head when you force him to read and try to laugh at the joke at the same time. Or read and try to have a, a, a capture the irony of the character's action versus what his words said. Those are the kind of things you see. And yet we'll put all the time and effort into focusing on the symptom instead of what actually the core problem is, which is that automaticity. Now the real reason we did this though is because your brain is not happy playing traffic cop. It does not like to stop one piece of information from coming out before it is able to retrieve what it's looking for to, to give. Meaning I asked you for the color, but what came first was the decoding of the text because that's our natural um, response when we see coded information. When we see letters, sounds, and symbols, we immediately read it. And for our brain, that little roadway that that 
that information is, is attached. If you look at the brain as a series of almost roadways and you look at the length of the roadway and the access to the roadway being um, um, consistent with how often that information is accessed. Meaning the more you use something, the quicker you have access to grab it, use it, talk about it, and, and flip it around. So since we constantly work with text from a reading or a writing perspective, the first thing to hit us was what the word was. It, it wasn't that it was difficult for us to say what the color was, it was that that information came after the word recognition, which means our mouth was dying to say yellow, because that's what the text said. But our brain was trying to say, okay, no, stop, wait. She doesn't want that, she wants you to say blue, because even though it does say yellow, the text is in blue. By the time you completed this process to get the word blue out of your mouth, we were already three colors ahead. And there went our rhythm. So that's called fighting the brain. It's just as simple as that. That's how hard it is. It can render you helpless with something you're perfectly capable of doing. But as soon as you do it in a way that goes against the brain, all bets are off. So it's just an interesting uh, way to not only notice why comprehension should not necessarily be the focus of every reading issue at upper grades, but also to notice what a complete no-win situation you place yourself in when you don't align with the way the brain learns. Now, typically the recipe for reading if something doesn't just make sense and get to go down the oh filter, which means I just get it because it makes sense based on what I know, is frequency, duration, and modality. And what that means is how often you do it, in what way you practice it, and for how long it takes. Different learners require different levels of these ingredients for the recipe. Some learners can do it one time for two seconds and it doesn't matter whether they see it, say it, do it, they got it like that. Other learners could do it 15 times every single day for two weeks straight. You have done it with a puppet. You have done it with a body. You have done it in an art class. You've done it in every possible modality you could think of to have Sally understand it. She finally gets it. And then the next day, it's like she never saw it before. <laughs> so different learners have different thresholds of what basically is use it or lose it. Because that's what this is. It's use it or lose it, but it depends on how much of these you need to have it stick. The ones who need the most typically get the least. And I don't just mean at home, I mean at school too, because the kids that pick up the skills faster get more time to incubate them, which means if I can learn things in kindergarten, like if I learn the th sound in kindergarten, I'll know it cold by the time the test comes, I'm not even thinking about that in third grade. But for the kids who struggle and lose information each year, we don't teach them a skill till they're ready for it, which means often some of the higher level phonics skills are held off until the last minute of second or third grade, so they're brand new by the time they get to third grade, and they have no ability then to use them with automaticity because they just got them like three weeks ago. Whereas little Johnny, who was gifted in first grade or kindergarten, he's been playing and manipulating these skills to read and write for three years straight. Because we wait to give the lower level learners things until they're ready, and by ready I mean ready to answer the front door because the front door is a whole different situation than the back door. They could be lounging out on a lounge chair in their back door, in their backyard, but they haven't built their house yet. They haven't even gotten like the, the permits pulled for it. But you, as the teacher, are knocking on that front door, meaning you've got a skill, they need to know it, you're not gonna give up, you're like the salesman that won't go away, because your job is to keep knocking. You don't get to say, well, Johnny's not home, oh well. Maybe next year, you just keep knocking and keep knocking and keep showing him the flashcard and keep trying to do the activity and you keep knocking. Not only is Johnny not at the door, there is no door. He doesn't have a house yet. He's in the backyard with a beer, you know, hanging out. Well, not with a beer, because he's not, he's a child, I'm sorry. <sighs> For adult ed, that would maybe be the, he's in the backyard with his Coke and he's just hanging out. He's not gonna answer a door. He doesn't know that the door's even there. The back door, however, or the back entrance is about a thousand feet wide. And as opposed to the front door, which is only about a foot wide and maybe a foot tall and you have to be a learner that can contort yourself just right to get through it. The back door is so big, it's even got suction. So if you just peek in to see what the heck's going on, you're sucked in and you learn it by default. So the back door is a whole different situation and using it, you can give learners access to things much earlier so that the learners that need the most of these things aren't stuck getting the least and then all of a sudden are hit with the test in third grade. Now here's what I mean by that. Imagine I am, and I'm gonna say kindergarten, and I hate to keep using this example, but I should probably just say zero-based knowledge learner. Whether that means that I am in fifth grade and just have so many holes in my skill ability that I seem to be totally unable to connect with what's going on in the classroom, 
Or maybe I'm brilliant in my own language, but I've come here and I don't even know what you're talking about because I don't speak this language and I have no ability to connect with anything. So kindergarten captures all of that because you don't get any more clueless than a kindergartner. They don't know who they are, where they are, what they're doing, and if you capture them on the first day of school, which is what I'm gonna demonstrate, half the time they can't stop crying long enough to even figure it out. So they are the perfect place to look for impact. Now, if you don't teach kindergarten or if you're not an administrator who has spent your first half of the morning every day or every year on the first day of school in the kindergarten wing, you may not know what kind of chaos is actually occurring down there. You've got criers, you've got yellers, you've got screamers. That's on the inside, of course, but you've got the same thing on the outside because you've got the moms who are also crying, yelling, and screaming. As badly as those kids went out, those moms went in. So you have a rock slash restraining effort going on in the classroom so the kids don't escape, and outside, usually that one's headed up by the counselor, rock slash restraining mom so that she doesn't keep trying to get into the classroom, which just makes Johnny continue crying even more. So typically administrators and anybody else they can pull that doesn't have a class of their own are on the inside of the classroom trying to help the teacher, and on the outside is everybody else trying to help the counselor, and it's just crazy, it's just bedlam. Now, while all this is going on, the teacher's, of course, running around. She has to figure out who's got a lunch, who doesn't, who can't have peanuts, whose dad can't pick them up, whose mom's not allowed to be there. None of this can be asked. They can't just say to their kids, raise your hand if you brought your lunch, because they're just going to get blank stares. So they have to go through the backpacks, literally investigate everything, try to come up with their best guess for almost everything that has to be turned in on that form. While this is happening, there is a little guy. He came to school. He's got a note pinned to his chest from mom to tell the teacher he's gifted. And he's been following her around, making sure she sees it, because mom said to him, make sure your teacher sees this, make sure you show her this. So she is aware that this is going on. She's supposed to call as soon as possible because the mom wants him put into another classroom. This little note led to a longer note in his backpack that said, she's thinking, you know, he already knows what everything kindergarten's gonna be covering, so he needs to go into another grade level. She's thinking second, maybe third. She's open to your input, but she doesn't want instructional time lost, so she'd really like him moved quickly, please call her. Now, she's already called the office once, and it is now 9.30. <laughs> Lunch is at 9.50. Oh, and by the way, this is how long it's taken before the teacher's actually ready to start the academic instructional day. And the only reason that it didn't state this on the lesson plan is the administrator will not allow her to write the word chaos between 8 a.m. <laughs> and 9.30. So according to the lesson plan, they've already practiced walking in line to lunch. But in all actuality, the teacher's just finally getting ready to start. So she would normally practice walking to lunch because lunch is at 9.50 because the school's overcrowded. And she doesn't want to be the kindergarten teacher that didn't get to practice walking in a line because we know what those lines look like. The kindergartners have no idea what a line even is. So you don't get to practice that. You're going to be the laughing stock of the school trying to get 36 kids to a lunchroom. Yes, there are schools that have 30. They just assume take the fine and save the money. <laughs> so there are many schools that do have 36 kindergartners and no aid. And this one particular teacher that blogged on my blog out of her 36 kindergartners, 32 were boys. Four girls, 32 boys. Her name is um, Renee uh, Mac Mac McNulty and she tracked the progress of her kids. So anyway, I'm gonna keep going because I, I know I'm gonna be quick with time. Okay, so Johnny comes up and he looks at the calendar and he says, when the teacher asks him if he knows the word, he goes, yeah, ah, ah, uh, uh, us, ah, uh, uh, us, ah, uh, uh, us. Now he did a great job trying to read that word. He had some great skills that he brought to the table. Problem is, he's not gonna get the word. The word's August. No matter what grade level you teach, whatever text level you work with, you'll have kids who will attack text and do everything right, but you have to make corrections for them, but you can't always tell them what they did wrong so that they can do it on their own the next time. In this case, yes, there's an AU. You could talk about the AUAW phonics situation, except this is kindergarten. Half your class is asleep already because they cried themselves to sleep. So you may not want to talk about AUAW. And even if you did explain the AUAW phonics rule, you know, you still have words like father. Or, um, I mean, not right now. I'm not thinking of several of them, but amen. There's uh, many words where that rule still doesn't hold its weight necessarily. So often you're still in the same boat as that kindergarten teacher who has to say, you know what, honey, it just is. It just does. You just have to remember. Now, if you have to say that, what you're telling the brain is stop thinking, stop patterning, just let it go. Let it go. I can see you. You're trying to connect what I said to what you know to be true. Don't do it. <laughs> don't. Don't try to. It doesn't fit. Let it go. It just is. Now, we don't want to tell them to stop patterning because that's like saying stop thinking. But yet, if you have no logical explanation, how do you provide it? There is a way to do it. Now, we want the why, first of all. 
Johnny's going to ask us. I forgot to tell you that. But Johnny, first thing out of his mouth is, why? Why is it August? Because A says, ah, ah, and A says, A. And U goes, uh, 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 and it goes U. And O is what goes, ah. And there's no O in that word. So why is that word August? So he's doing a great job of putting out a platter of what he knows to be true and basically just asking you, how do you fit what you just said with what I already know is correct? Make this fit together, because mom wasn't so sure about you anyway. That's why she pinned this note to my chest. So <laughs> I'm not convinced that I should throw away everything I've learned over the last five years because you've just said so. So how do you make this fit together? Now he wants to go, oh, but he can't unless we can give him some kind of logical explanation. Now. Research shows that the best thinkers are actually the best pattern makers. We want the why. Why means two things. It means he knew enough to know something wasn't right, and he was motivated and determined to get to the bottom of it. That's what we want. Ignorance is bliss. Little Susie, who doesn't even know her name is Susie, she's asleep on the rug, and she woke up and smiled, and if she said, if we told her it was a zebra up there on the calendar, she'd be fine. If you don't know what you don't know, your pulse rate doesn't increase. It's only when you know just enough to know that what you're looking at isn't the way it's supposed to look, but you don't know why, that you get frustrated. So we want the why. Why is diagnostic critical thinking in a nutshell? Now, Einstein has a wonderful quote. If the facts don't fit the theory, change the facts. If the facts are we're stuck having to tell Johnny it just is, it just does, you just have to remember, because there is this thing called phonics, but you're too young for me to talk about it in its full capacity right now, but even if I did, there'd still be times where I've got to constantly tell you it just is, it just does, you just have to remember. I know it stinks, but that's the way it is, so we're going to just practice until we know it. Now, obviously, that we wouldn't tell Johnny that, but those are the facts. But Einstein's quote, which educators don't often hear, I think because it seems like it would be um, unethical, but because it sounds like it's saying, you know, create your hypothesis, try to prove it out. If your facts don't show it's correct, that's okay. Change them. <laughs> Say it worked. <laughs> and that isn't what he's saying. What he's saying is when you're stuck working with options that are bordered by the box of facts, then you only have so many options. Those options are finite. And no matter how deep you dig, you're still going to find the same things in that box. The only way to change your options is to change the facts, because the facts dictate the box of options that you're working with. So you can't change all facts, but you can change some. You can't change scientific law facts, but you can change academic principle facts. If I drop something, it will fall, because that's the way gravity works. And nothing I say can change that. But I could change that we call it gravity because that's just a man-made fact. If you go to Germany, they call it something else. So that's something I could change if it were to be of tremendous use or value for me to do so. So I am going to use Einstein's logic, and I'm going to tell Johnny, there's a reason you can't read this word, Johnny. There's a secret in this word. It's a grown-up reading and writing secret. Now, I know it and all of them because I am a grown-up, and I have a grown-up-sized brain. You're a kid with a kid-sized brain. So if I tell you a grown-up reading and writing secret before your brain is ready for it, your brain could explode. And I do not want that to happen, so I've got to be awfully careful with the ones that I tell you. Now, do not say that if you actually are in kindergarten, because you'll set your criers back off again. <laughs> but there is a significant motivational factor to this, which is I've got these skills, you want them, I'll decide if you're ready, but I wouldn't hold my breath, because this is a big one. These are secrets, not even skills. These are secrets. So you're not chasing them around with the book, trying to tell them how important it is that they know the difference between E-U-E-W, O-U-O-W, and A-U-A-W, because the test is on Friday, and you're going to mix them all up. You've got all the info. They're dying to have it, but you're, you know, you got to divvy it out carefully because this is big stuff. It totally changes the dynamics and brings back the why. We want them to critically think and have bells and whistles go off when text contradicts itself. The reason we want it is now we actually have ways to give them answers that allow them to connect dots using logic and bypass the use it or lose it as the only way to have these skills solidified. Now, Johnny, there are two letters in this word August that are in love. And I mean head over heels, huge crush on each other. They're A and U. And it's actually not just A and U. A and W are in love too, but they're not in this word. But anytime you see these letters right up against each other in a word, side by side, they get so embarrassed that they always put their heads down and say, ah, ah, and that's the sound they make. And it's not just in this word, August. Look over here. Look at this word. Awesome. Look at this word. Awful. Look at his name tag. Austin, look at all the words that have these grown up, this grown up reading and writing secret. Now, if you didn't know the secret, you'd think this word was awful, or this word was awesome, or you'd think his name was Aston. And then you'd have to go, Mom, I can't read this word, I don't know the secret. Now you know the grown up reading and writing secret, so you can read all those words. Now, here's what happens. First of all, Johnny gets to go, Oh, because it connects, it makes sense. You gave him, you left him with his knowledge of what he already had, but you gave him an if not then that alternative. You gave him a default. This is what it still does. This is what I can still expect. All the words at home I have about acorns and apricots in my little books, they still work. It's just that sometimes this is what's going on. 
Now, that little default is the building of what we're gonna create as a thinking path. It's a thinking construct. But the real issue here isn't what Johnny can do. Johnny's a given. Johnny walks to lunch, he sees a fire extinguisher on the wall. He's immediately using this new key to open doors that he knew were locked before. He says, look, automatic. I can read the word under the fire extinguisher now. Automatic, because the letter's in love in it. I didn't know that when I came to school, but now I can read it, see? So he's doing what our teacher Radar tells us he would, which is he needed the tool, he asked for the tool, we gave it to him, he's using it to attack new things. Lulu's the one that actually what research shows is the key here. Lulu just woke up, she thought, her name was Meredith all morning. She didn't know her name is Lulu. Nobody told her Lulu's great grandma. You won't know till it's time for dismissal. You thought Lulu was just uh, dropped off with no paperwork and you're thinking Meredith is absent right now. So you're worlds away from ever working with her on this phonics pattern. This is actually like a second grade phonics pattern anyway. She'll be lucky to get it in third grade. But she woke up because she heard something novel. The brain is immediately attentive to anything that comes out of the blue or out of the normal pattern expectation. So she heard, Ah, uh, when you were showing that little poster that looked like this. And she, and you're gonna be able to download these by the way. She said, she didn't say anything actually, she just looked up and smiled. But what happened was she heard you say something about they're in love. Now, she can do something fascinating that is the precursor to decoding and encoding and lets her start incubating now instead of when she's finally ready to get this at the end of second grade when it's too late because she'll be doing the testing the next year and she won't even know it because it'll be too little too late. If I say, Lulu, what sound do these letters make? She can go, ah. Now keep in mind, she doesn't know a letter from a number, but that's okay. She saw this symbol, a sound came out of her mouth. That's the stepping stone to what will become decoding. Because that's all decoding is, see a symbol, make a sound. And you want it to be that fast. Now if I flip it around and I say, Lulu, and let's say I have 10 of these up. There's actually, I actually created a secret for anything that happens more than five times in text. Anytime. And if it's got multiple possibilities, there's multiple defaults. And we'll talk about how that's structured in a minute. But if I have 10 of these up and I say, Lulu, go point to the letters that say, ah, she can do the reverse. She can take that sound and identify the symbol that's making it. That's a stepping stone to what will become encoding or writing, which means here's the sound I want. What symbol do I need to make it as a writer? Now, she's not using this for that purpose. She's using this like she would if it were a kid in her class. Like, that's my friend. She knows what that friend looks like, and she can predict their behavior. She gives me cookies every day. This is no different than that. Here's what it looks like. Here's what I can expect from it. That's the track this took in her brain. Not which letters are they, in what particular sequence do they fall, and what sound do they make is in which words. Because those are property that hasn't been built yet. That's the grass and the dirt that you have to have in order to plant the tree. She doesn't have the grass and the dirt. She doesn't even know her name, let alone what sounds are here and what letters these are and in what order they're in. But she can see a symbol, make a sound, hear a sound, find a symbol. It's buried in a simple story. Now, the way that this actually works, we're using brain plasticity to allow parts of the brain that are developed to take over for parts that are not. We look at this in research for stroke victims because you have areas of the brain that stop working and you have to be able to circumvent, and the brain does this naturally, but there are ways to help it along to help it rewire correctly. Basically, you're just getting around what doesn't work, tapping into what does, and the brain will naturally rewire itself as a process to, um, to function in the most effective way. So if we have certain centers that aren't up and on board, whether because she's not developmentally ready or she has no language base, because that's a whole other issue. That's not a glitch, that's just I have no language, I'm an ESL learner, I don't own that language, I gotta take a different path. It should go here, but it's not because there's nothing here because I don't own any sounds in English. So my language processing center doesn't light up when you tell me words in English because I don't know what they mean. So it's going into centers that are already fully developed. And the part of the brain that's fully developed for little learners are social emotive. And actually for all learners, adult ed as well. The back, the brain develops back to front and the back of the brain is the social emotive center. That's the part they come in with that already is intact. It is functioning at a high level. It is the part that they use to retrieve information at home like what Johnny did, what his punishment was, what the principal said when he came to get him, and what the mom said she was gonna do to him if she did it again. You know, they can tell you all that at home at dinner. They can't say what book they read, but they can say who got in trouble, who the line leader was, why they got fired, and what happens the next time if they do that again. The social emotive behaviors are the part of their brain, that part of their brain, it's not that they have just extra interest in that. It's that that's the part of the brain that functions at a quicker rate and with more, um, capability. It's got much more uh, bang for the buck in terms of what it can do and what, it, what it's able to store and what, what you can do with what's stored there. So if we can take these skills through the back door and tap into their strength, we get easier access to critical skills at a much earlier age. 
Now, this just gives you a little idea, but basically you're tapping into feeling embarrassed or how you feel if you go, you know, if you send third graders to square dance and music class and they come back and they tell the teacher about who had to square dance with who and who got to sashay with who, watch their little cheeks turn red. I mean, they know they can relate to social interactions in that type of way. So all we're really doing is taking predictable behaviors and attaching them to what something looks like. They do this all the time. They could easily tell your sub, he spits, she's nice, he always hits people. I know what you look like and I know what you're likely to do. We're just taking that same kind of connection and applying it to patterns and to letters and to sounds. And as we do this, we're creating multi-layered memories. What's used together is fused together in the brain. So the way that they can actually not just store the information but retrieve it, uh, it becomes intermeshed. And things come together in such a way that learners can pick their access point and retrieve it with ease, regardless of where their deficits lie. So it lets you get around areas that normally would be a giant blockade in your effort to capture these skills or to impart these skills, and instead take an alternative route, but it's all fused together. So basically what I'm saying is you can get through the front door even though the front door is not built and go get them out of that lawn chair. <laughs> and you don't have to have ground in place. You're not, you're not following the same set of rules that you would if you took skills through that front door. Now basically if you have logic, you can apply and I didn't mean to go so fast, you can apply logic where otherwise there wouldn't be, then you can think your way through certain, uh, certain concepts, certain, certain ideas when it comes to working with text, because text doesn't do the same thing all the time. And what I mean by that is just because you know a sound doesn't mean that's always going to be the same thing. And I know I'm supposed to be stopping in a few minutes, so I want to get to this little part here. When we look at the science of storytelling, and I'm going to say this very quickly, uh, I'm going to let this sit for a minute. I will tell the kids, and this is just to give you a quick idea. I started out with why. I'm going to finish with why, just to give you this quick concept of how this works. And I'm sorry to skip right through this. Why got sick and tired of walking around saying, yeah, all the time. And I'm sorry I'm going through all these. I'm looking for the right one. He got sick and tired of walking around saying, yeah, all the time. So he snuck into, and I, you don't know that these guys exist, but they do. There are superheroes in the alphabet, they're the vowels. They're the only letters in the alphabet that have the power to say their name. And that's a huge deal, because if you're a K and you walk around every day of your life going kuh, 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 it gets really boring. So having the ability to say your name, they're the envy of all the other letters. Why well, got sick and tired of walking around saying yeah. So he decided he was gonna sneak into the closets of superhero E and superhero I and take one of each of their capes, which is where their powers lie. So now, whenever he's at the end of a word, Never the beginning, because that's like being the line leader. If you're going to hit Susie over the head, you're not going to do it when you're the line leader. You're going to wait till you're the caboose. Because at the caboose end, you can get away with anything. The line leader, all eyes are on you. Why is not stupid? He realizes, if I'm at the front of a word, everybody's watching me. I'm just going to stand up and say what I should and go, yuck, yuck, yellow, yes, you, yuck, yuck, yuck. But when I'm at the end and nobody's watching me, I am always going to be sneaky, and I'm going to wear either the ear or the eye cape so that I can use their superpowers and make their sound. Like mommy, daddy, candy, scut, I, July. Now, you put them at the beginning of the word, yeah, yeah, yellow, yes, you. He's going to be a good little line leader. Now, if you're wondering, what about words like today or they? Because I like that little, that's a cute little trick, but what about words where he doesn't do either E or I some? That's not sneaky Y. That's E-Y-A-Y. And if you're 40 or over, you know who Fonzie is. <laughs> well, E-Y-A-Y are just too cool, so they always stick up their thumbs and go, eh. And that's the sound they make. But the point that I'm making here is, and the Army uses this as well, and it's called situation-based training, but it's a thinking construct that allows learners to navigate decision making based on a template that we put in place. So if we can put, and this is where I'm gonna go through, it's like a little emotional rudder. We can give them insight into making decisions about text, what sound could it be, what else could I try, based on things that they already know from a social emotive end. Like, I know when I'm sneaky, and it's not gonna be when I'm at front and center, but I know when I'm at the back, that's when I'm most likely to do this, that, or the other. Likewise, Mommy E, when Mommy E is one letter away from a vowel, that is when that vowel has to stand up tall and straight and say his name. So that is when you will have a word like like, or if I have a little girl that writes I hat my sister, the first thing I say is, who needs to be at the end of that word if you want that A to stand up tall and straight and say her name? And she'll go, Mommy E, because if Mommy's not there, that vowel gets to be short and lazy, just like you'd be if your Mommy weren't right there, close enough, one letter away, that easily she could reach over their head and make sure you said your name like you should. If she's not there, that vowel gets to be short and lazy, and that's why it's huh, at my sister. Now, a word like butter, mommy's there, but she's two letters away. She can yell and scream all she wants. Bottom line is her arms aren't long enough to reach over the head of both of those letters to make that you say his name. And that's why that word's butter, because the U gets to be short and lazy, because mommy can't reach him. 
So it's a fascinating way to take knowledge and impart it to learners in such a way that they can then make decisions that are outside of the box of what that applied to to start with. Take it up a notch and you've got babysitter vowels, because we all know that it's not just a mommy E that makes another vowel long. You've got basically, and I, I'm gonna wrap this up in a second, but you've got vowel consonant vowel versus vowel consonant consonant vowel. One makes a long sound, one makes a short sound, and for those of you under 30 who didn't learn this the torturous way, like we all did with open and closed syllables, basically, if you divide between the two T's and the word butter, you get a closed syllable, which is a short vowel, which is why it's butter. If you divide after the vowel, like in the word motor, uh, you get a open syllable, which of course is why the O is long. So bottom line is, mommy's gotta get out of the house. And when she does, she puts another vowel in charge, which if you got five kids, somebody's gotta be old enough to babysit. <laughs> so when you see any vowel that's one letter away from another vowel, that's just the babysitter. It's gonna do exactly what mom would if she were there, which is tell that vowel that's one letter away, you say your name. <laughs> so if you've got a word like motor, it's easily understood and predicted by a five-year-old because a five-year-old can say, I see a babysitter vowel in that word, and all that means is he's gonna do what mommy would if they were there. Now that's an emotional rudder. That's what we do with 18-year-old soldiers who we have to impart a certain thinking construct into so they can make decisions in a field that may not be in the box decisions we've already gone over, but decisions that are out of the box, but based on our thinking. In other words, using a knowledge base they already have that's familiar to navigate decision, decision making with unfamiliar circumstances. It's a really fun way to teach. And any kind of storytelling will get you there. But it's a fascinating way to, uh, to approach these skills. Now I am supposed to stop talking about three minutes ago. So as I said, there are gonna be so many pieces that I didn't even get to talk about. But anything that uh, I have said that you have interest in looking deeper into, please look at that blog or vlog. And if there's anything that you see in the PowerPoint that isn't self-explanatory once you pair it up with the handout, uh, feel free to email me because there are some things that in my two hour sessions I get to and in my one hour I don't. But the logic that, the, the mindset that I'm gonna leave you with is such that you should be able to apply everything in your packet uh, just with what we've talked about today. So I hope I've answered, I've given you enough information but let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.